Hello, everybody, and welcome. It is so great to be with you. Uh, we were just discussing the weather and how challenging it is for other parts of the world. Uh, we're going to hit, uh, oh, I don't know, 105 or 106 here. Uh, we've had some stormy days. Sounds like it's rain in there, but that's all right. We'll uh, uh, put all that aside and take a little trip to the Caribbean. So as always, I welcome you to another one of our legendary foods of today we are going to explore the caribbean and i have to tell you that i actually have not been to the caribbean before and as we talked about this particular uh topic and putting it together i thought well this would really be fun for this time of year uh with the beautiful palm trees and the ocean behind us the beautiful food so as i was doing my research and putting together our presentation, I really discovered that there's some amazing, amazing cuisine. And a lot of it will be shared between the different islands. And that's what we're going to sort of do today. We're going to look at a little bit of the history as we bounce around the different islands today. Um, I uh, prepared some of the food for this presentation a couple of weeks ago in anticipation of this. And certainly we know Jamaican jerk and plantains and mofongo and all kinds of things. So we're going to stick with primarily the island of the Caribbean. We're going to say Puerto Rico and Cuba for another time because they really do deserve their own presentation. So we need to look at the cuisine of the Caribbean. What are its influences? And I'll give you a little head start on this. It is an incredible amalgamation, an incredible fusion and a lot of that has to do with not only the geography, but the history. And because of its location there in the Caribbean, we're going to see tremendous influence, uh, some surprising influences, certainly the African influence. We're going to see the Spanish influence, a Dutch influence. We're going to see native influence and even Chinese and Indian influence with it today. So come along, relax, pour yourself a... Uh, daiquiri or something something else here uh and we will begin by looking at the legendary foods of the caribbean so or let's uh, sail away here and enjoy some of the food and cuisine of the area so uh when people envision the caribbean they immediately conjure up images of expansive white beach shorelines swaying palm fronds and uh, beautiful blue water stretching as far as the eye can see. The laid back island lifestyle is one of the Caribbean's biggest attractions, which explains why it's become such a hot spot for travelers across the globe. From family getaways to romantic es escapes and adventuresome excursions, there is truly something for everybody to discover in the islands. Very diverse uh, destinations, scattered across this idyllic region. The Caribbean is composed of over 700 islands, um, inlets, caves, and reefs. We've seen these glamorized in movies. Certainly the earliest memory that I have of the Caribbean is one of the early James Bond films with the beautiful Ursula Andress coming out of the Caribbean in that iconic white bikini and James Bond uh, cavorting around in one of those early films. Uh, with a range of uh, incredible hotels and resorts scattered around the Caribbean, you can enjoy the lap of luxury with pools to take a swim, spas to relax in, and of course, incredibly delicious food also. Caribbean cuisine is another delectable draw to, that keeps people coming back for more. It's a wonderfully unique amalgamation of flavors, ingredients, and influences that allude to the area's sordid past and multicultural roots. But to fully appreciate the region's signature dishes, we have to understand a little bit of its history. For centuries, the Caribbean islands were under European rule. Many of the ingredients that have become synonymous with Caribbean food, things like mangoes and breadfruit and sugarcane, were actually introduced by countries such as Spain and France and Holland and even England. The development of the Caribbean cuisine was also undeniably influenced by the culture of Africa and Asia and India in the early 1800s. These global influences combined with indigenous Caribbean ingredients and techniques 
have played a paramount role in defining the evolution of the modern Caribbean cuisine that we know today and that we love so much. From soups to stews to desserts, many of the region's signature staples surprisingly trace their beginnings back to European and African countries where they originated. So we're gonna be looking at the 700 islands and discovering some of the aspects that made Caribbean food so wonderful and so flavorful. Certainly these incredible images of tropical waters, beautiful swaying palm trees, the really interesting people and different cultures, the foods and the lifestyle is an important part of the Caribbean experience. And we got to welcome the pirates and wenches there as well. Uh, certainly an interesting part of it. And let's talk about the real influence of the pirates of the Caribbean. The Spanish conquered the Aztecs and the Incas. And they created a rich empire in Central America with ships laden with gold that sailed back to Spain. Well, this provided rich pickings for pirates, including many English pirates. So a pirate is any person who uses the sea to commit theft. And the romanticized and comical version of Pirates of the Caribbean tells us only part of the story. Pirates could be people who use boats to attack ports or ships, and may even apply to those people who simply escaped by sea. The term is loose enough that it can encompass a whole specific group of slavers and uh, pirates that were just out for their booty of wealth. Now, a privateer is a little bit different. You'll hear that sometimes talked about as well. It's an individual who's been granted licenses by their government to attack sh uh, shipping belonging to an enemy government, usually during a war. Privateers are a little bit like and, uh, private contractors. They receive a letter of mark from their uh, nation's admiralty, uh, which grants them per permission to raid enemy ships and keep a percentage of the spoils. And then we have our buccaneer. And this is used synonymously with the ideal of a 17th or 18th century Caribbean pirate, but in actuality, it means something quite specific. So when Spain started colonizing the Caribbean in the 16th century, it was initially the only nation to do so. Around the 17th century, <clears throat> people from other nations like France and England and Holland started to settle in the Caribbean also. The problem was they weren't welcome in Spanish ports because the Spanish didn't recognize their right to settle. As a result, the only people willing to trade with these settlers and adventurers were social outcasts like the mulattoes, Native Americans, and shipwrecked sailors who largely lived in the wild. Remember that name, Buccaneer. We're going to introduce you to an interesting concept that they gave us. Here's a wonderful short little video that just gives you a really good overview. So a chance for you to catch up, maybe pour yourself a nice cool drink, and although it says for kids, it really is a really a good video to get an overview of the Caribbean. So sit back, have a sip of your mojito or daiquiri and uh, enjoy this video. The Caribbean is made up of three main island chains. They are called the Lesser and Greater Antilles and the Bahamas. The Lesser Antilles includes a chain of islands that start at Trinidad in the south, and end at the three U.S. Virgin Islands in the north. The Greater Antilles is made up of Hispaniola, Cuba, Jamaica, and Puerto Rico. The Bahamas are north of Hispaniola and Cuba. The first group of people believed to live in the Caribbean islands were the Sabonis, who came there nearly four or four, five thousand years ago. Later, the Tainos and the Caribs were two groups of people who lived on the islands. They had come from the Americas thousands of years before. The Caribs were a warrior tribe and wore their hair black and long. They dressed in feathers and necklaces made of their victims' teeth and painted their bodies red. They fished and hunted to eat and lived in thatched shelters. At one point, the Caribs began forcing the Tainos off the islands. The Carib people were generally more peaceful and were farmers who cultivated yucca and sweet potatoes. They were also excellent hunters using bows and arrows to shoot their prey. The Caribbean was discovered by Europeans when Christopher Columbus in 1492, in search of a new trade route to the east, found them. He landed in the Bahamas and named the island San Salvador. 
He thought he had found the spice islands of the West Indies, and because of his mistake, Spain named them as such, and they have the same name today. When Christopher Columbus landed in the Bahamas, the people living there, also called indigenous peoples, he called them Indians. They were made up of the Caribs and the Tainos. Queen Isabella of Spain did not allow the enslavement of some of these people, but it happened anyway. The first settlement by Spain was in Hispaniola in 1493. Their main interest in the islands were gold and mining other precious metals. And here the Spanish built fortresses to protect what they considered to be their property. For this reason, other European countries were not able to settle in these areas, but instead took some of the settlements where the Spanish weren't as strong. For example, the British colonized Barbados and the French took Martinique and Guadalupe and the Dutch controlled Aruban, St. Martin, and a few other islands in the 1600s. Sadly, most of the native people living on these islands were forced into slavery to work for the settlers, and eventually most of them died off because of diseases and how poorly they were treated. Soon it was found that the Carib Caribbean islands were perfect for farming sugar, so sugar plantations began to become very popular. But because the native people had died off, they were no longer slaves to farm the land. For this reason, slavers moved to Africa and started kidnapping the people there and forcing them into slavery in the Caribbean. Over 10 million African slaves were taken by boat to the Caribbean to be slaves on the sugar plantations. They were packed so tightly into the ships, often 12% of them died along the way. Once arriving on the islands, they were auctioned off and traded. Because of how cruelly they were treated, many of these slaves escaped or led revolts and started their own communities away from the plantations. To this day, many of the people living on the islands are descendants of these slaves. In the 1800s, slavery was also outlawed by the British and eventually the French and Dutch and Spanish. The cost of produ producing sugar also grew, so there was a decline in production at this time. In 1789, slaves led by Toussaint Louverture revolted and took control of their own country of Haiti and later became independent of France in 1804. After Haiti, the Dominican Republic and Cuba also became independent, along with Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago. The Caribbean is also known for its history of pirates. In the early 1600s, pirates made their home on many of the islands. Many of them raised cattle and traded them, which is where the name buccaneers comes from, because they cured the meat in ovens called bucons. They lived in small clans and were made up of many different backgrounds. Many found their home base in Tortuga, off the coast of Haiti. From here, they ventured out and attacked ships to steal their goods. Today, the Caribbean is more civilized and has become a tour destination for people all over the world. It's large hotels, cater to visitors who want to come spend time on the beaches, enjoy the warm crystal blue water, and do other water activities such as snorkeling and scuba diving. The Caribbean is also known as a prime destination for cruise ships that are constantly docking to unload tourists to enjoy the beautiful tropical weather and scenery of the islands. Be sure to check out our podcast on Apple Podcasts. So a really good overview there of some of the history. So we heard the uh, term Carib, uh, some of the earliest uh, people of the island from which we draw the name Caribbean and the um, Arawak as well and uh, the uh, Tano Indians. So a lot of these uh, descendants today have brought their traditions and their culture into the food. And this group of uh, people, the Arawaks, uh, were some of the first people, and they made this grate of thin green wood strips on which they slowly cooked meat. And um, they called this process barbacoa, and it's from which we get the word barbecue. So we have a lot to thank the early indigenous people and the Caribbean for some of these wonderful food ideas. Um, the pirates have certainly been part of the legend and the lore of this. And these uh, Pirates of the Caribbean movies are wonderful. And there's always a little grain of truth behind some of this um, uh, frivolity that we've seen in the movies. But nonetheless, it brought these incredible traditions of really great food and the plunder and all of the 
uh, antics of the pirates and the men and women. Uh, at this time, pirating had to have been a pretty lucrative job for many uh, young men that couldn't uh, make it in their hometown, or maybe they were running away from something, or maybe they were looking for something. Either way, the legend of the pirates and the pirates' booty and the shipwrecks uh, have proven to be very interesting. We're continually finding evidence of these shipwrecks, and occasionally we'll see uh, new revelations of some astounding ones. But you can see how their ports of call here, in particular, really just crisscrossed the Caribbean. And of course, as they were uh, engaged in the very, very unpleasant and sad slave trade as well, uh, like so many traditions, uh, th this is one that what has a very, very dark past. Uh, and we look at it with revulsion, but what it did is really spread some interesting ideas. It spread some interesting new traditions, certainly in the way of food also. But had to have been a, a very tough life. Uh, every time you needed supplies of some sort, certainly didn't have the refrigeration and things like that, but sugar was an important part of it. And eventually the food products that we saw as well. Uh, I was so fascinated by this, I developed a whole new program on uh, the sugar trade and the uh, really uh, awful aspects of the um, uh, sugar trade in this particular area, particularly by led by the slaves. So there's an uh, a modern day version of the barbecue there. So they would take these uh, pieces of wood there to create what we think of today as a modern barbecue. And so you get the benefits of the slow roasting that everybody loves with a barbecue. We'll come back and we'll visit this when we look at some of the food. Uh, we know that the Carib Indians added more spice to their food with hot pepper sauces, and they added lemon and lime juice to their meat and fish recipes. So it's become an important part of it. So next time you fire up the barbecue, you have these buccaneers from the Caribbean to really thank for that. Uh, the Caribs had a very, very uh, big impact on the early Caribbean history. And we're going to see a lot of that as the food uh, shows in these uh, dishes that have become iconic of Caribbean cuisine. Today, of course, it is a haven for uh, vacationers, newlyweds. Now families are beginning to go there. We're seeing ecotourism in some of the areas as well. And some of the islands are much more developed than others, some probably overly developed. But nonetheless, we have uh, some wonderful resorts. So we're going to take a look at them sort of alphabetically here. And if anybody has been to these islands, I would welcome your input. So put your recollections in the in the uh, chat area, and we'll talk a little bit about those. So we get an overview here. As I said, we'll come back and we'll talk another time about Cuba and Puerto Rico in particular. We'll touch a little bit on Jamaica, and we can't really be in the Caribbean without talking about Jamaica. It's become a really, really popular destination. And all of these islands, including Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Jamaica to a certain extent, Grenada, uh, they've had difficulties and challenges. We reference that in some of the slave uprisings and things like that. And we're going to see real extremes in wealth and poverty spread across these islands. A lot of that has to do with the history of them. So the West Indies are really where we're going to spend most of our time here as we go through them. You can see how close these islands are for them. Uh, some of them are in a direct hurricane area. And every time we see some of these images, it just really breaks your heart to see these little islands because they really uh, rely upon the mainland for many of their supplies. Absolutely everything has to be brought in with the exception of anything that may be local in the way of fish or fruit uh, or vegetables that they may have. So uh, give me a week on a deserted beach like this and I would just be perfectly happy there. Beautiful year round uh, climate. Uh, these beautiful piers, a chance to explore some of the crystal blue waters that you find in these islands uh, out on a boat or on the shore or just spending some time at the resorts is pretty spectacular. So if you've been to any of these islands, drop a line in chat there. Uh, I um, don't handle the sun as well as I used to, and I'm a tad bit claustrophobic, so scuba diving is sort of out of the question for me, but the idea of snorkeling in some of these beautiful waters is very intriguing for me. 
So whether you're on a small boat or a luxury yacht or a cruise ship, seeing these beautiful villages tucked up as they approach the mountains, these beautiful caves, these beautiful islands there, and certainly the food is an important part of it. That to me just says Caribbean food. This was a plate that I had uh, just a couple of weeks ago at a local restaurant. The um, uh, slaves had to be very innovative because uh, the slave owners kept them on very, very short uh, leash as far as what they uh, would feed them. They certainly were not feeding them the most expensive fish or meat products. So the early slaves had to be very innovative and they brought incredible recipes from their African roots and some of the staples that they found on the land. The Africans introduced okra and callaloo and fish cakes, salt fish, something known as aki, pudding and mangoes, and the list goes on and on. Then the uh, English and the French and the Dutch brought some influences as well. And then later we have uh, the introduction of uh, Asian influences as well as Indian influences. So from sort of top left all the way around there, we have beautiful ceviche with all the fresh shellfish, uh, marinade in lime juice or fruit juices, the acid sort of works as the cooking method. We have fried products, uh, the plantains, fried plantains are one of those wonderful, wonderful treats. If you've ever seen these in the grocery store, uh, they look like a great big green banana. When they're in that green state, they're very, very hard. Uh, and really you wanna treat those almost like a potato. And then they're going to start turning black. If you want this to taste like a sweet banana, you need to let this go to absolutely jet black. And uh, then it tastes a little bit more like what we would think of as a traditional banana. So it's one of those really versatile ingredients. So don't be afraid if it goes completely black on you. We have wonderful stews, we have curries, we have these interesting Indian influences. You have incredible fresh, fresh fish. And then down at the bottom, you have that callaloo, that wonderful um, uh, greens uh, stewed dish as well that uh, we'll talk about here in a minute. So how about breakfast? Let's start with uh, one of the most interesting meals of the day. If you've been to resort, chances are you've probably had an American or a Europeanized uh, breakfast. But in fact, uh, breakfast is obviously in many of these areas been an important meal. Their uh, Dutch influences, French, even Spanish influences here for breakfast. Uh, a lot of the islands have a commonality when it comes to food. All the islands were occupied by indigenous people before the Europeans colonized them. So we have lots of similarity in these. Um, as Europeans came from Spain and Britain, the Netherlands and Portugal, they brought their cuisines and they became part of uh, the Caribbean diet. Much later, waves of immigrants from Asia, particularly India, brought rich curry and delicacies. Traditional dishes reflect the blend of people from the Americas and from Asia. So here we have uh, sort of an Americanized Caribbean uh, fresh fruit, indigenous fruit. Cherries aren't native to the region, but they are uh, bringing in a lot of these specialty products. Avocado, yes, uh, greens, plantains, certainly eggs and protein. Probably pig is what we're going to find mostly uh, because they come to market pretty quickly. You're not going to find a lot of beef because there just isn't the grazing for these. Uh, so chicken and eggs and pork are going to be some of the protein staples. Beautiful breakfast here, some fresh Jamaica Blue Mountain coffee, some beautiful fresh fruit, um, some exotic uh, breads that you may have, the influence with it, and always set amidst a beautiful area. Um, this is a beautiful dish here as well. This is um, the sweet sort of a yeasty roll there. Uh, very much influenced by the Asian and even the Spanish style of stuffing uh, food or peppers or unusual ingredients in these little uh, rolls. This uh, butter bread is very, very different than any kind of traditional European bread, certainly very different from the uh, French breads as well. This is an indigenous product, probably highly influenced by that really wonderful butter bread that we see in um, the um, Central America and Mexico. Huevos habaneros, if you've ever enjoyed 
um, uh, huevos rancheros, really it's sort of a, a Tex-Mex style as well. So what we're doing is we're adding these habaneros to it. That's that hot scotch bonnet pepper. That's that orange pepper. If you ever work with it, it is exceedingly hot. So be careful when you're handling it. Uh, a little goes a long way. But starting off the day with a nice spicy breakfast is always welcome in the Caribbean. This is a wonderful dish here. This is uh, primarily in the Bahamas here, but it's this um, chicken souse dish here, breakfast, lunch, or dinner. It's got chicken pieces, chicken thighs bring a lot of flavor to this. You've got onions and potatoes. You've got those wonderful uh, mild uh, goat peppers there, lime juice, a little bit of butter. This is uh, supposedly a great cure for hangover. And if you've been enjoying the beer or the rum of the islands, uh, traditionally served with Johnny cakes or maybe some hot grits. Very, very Asian inspired. Uh, if you've ever been to a Thai or Vietnamese restaurant on a Saturday or Sunday morning, uh, this is very similar to pho. Uh, it makes a lot of sense rather than those heavy carbohydrates that we think of with an American breakfast. So wonderful dish here called Fire Engine. This is a mix of chorizo. This has got some white rice on it. There's the fire. There's the cooling aspect with the rice. Uh, There's a lot of peppers in this. And as always, I'll send this uh, recipes to you in our packet. A wonderful dish that just celebrates the Caribbean. This is a marvelous dish here as well. This is called um, Doubles here. And this is kind of a, a wonderful uh, English inspired dish that is uh, crispy, it's kind of uh, sweet at the same time. Interesting mix of batters that we have in there. Uh, this is one of those really, really fun dishes that you find only in the Caribbean. <clears throat> uh, this is a wonderful dish here as well. This is uh, mashed plantains, uh, a little bit like mofongo. Uh, you can see on the right there, it might be served uh, with a, a poached egg or some avocado. You might have some uh, uh, peppers served alongside of this, but this is one of those really, really wonderful dishes that we see only in the Caribbean. Aki and saltfish, we looked at this just a minute ago. Aki is this very interesting ingredient, has a very, very distinctive flavor. The saltfish obviously comes from the uh, style of preservation of fish. We know it in Portugal as bacalao. In Brazil, they have the same type of thing. Cod was readily available and they used it for other type of fish uh, to salt them as a method of preservation. Bami are really wonderful. These are a very, very interesting sort of dish that um, is um, made from pounded uh, vegetables here. Sometimes they'll use yucca on this as well. Delicious dish, one of the signature dishes of uh, Jamaica. If this slide looks like it's in the wrong place here, actually this is that um, uh, Trinidad via uh, Indian type of cuisine here. Very spicy mashed potatoes. Uh, this has uh, Indian origins, but with this really uh, spicy kind of Trinidad influence. Uh, frequently eaten for breakfast, it's a, a really nice way to sort of jolt your day. Uh, a lot of these are common ingredients that are readily available. I'll include this also. If we start uh, with Anguilla here, although it's developing rapidly as vacationers discovered it, uh, spectacular beaches, uh, Anguilla is a quiet, sleepy, relatively free of racial tensions, unlike some of the other islands that have evolved over time. It's a flat coral island, maintains its maritime tradition of proud fishermen. Many of them still make their living from the sea, catching lobsters, selling them to the uh, local resorts. It's a very expensive destination with small and rather exclusive resorts. Um, it's a, a really laid back, wonderful opportunity each one of these uh, islands has their own sort of chamber of commerce or vacation board. So that beautiful expanse of beaches is certainly what attracts people. All of these islands, so with the exception of very few, you're gonna find these wonderful villages that sort of reflect the uh, people that settled it. You'll see some that look very, very Dutch-like, others that look very Spanish, some that are very, very English in style. And Everywhere you go, you're gonna find this idea of the barbecue. You're gonna find grilled meats, particularly shellfish in this area. 
those of you that have been there would love to hear what your experience is with um, pricing. We think of shellfish as being fairly expensive. I'd love to know if there are any places that actually offer this as really good value. So everything from octopus to shrimp to lobster and langoustines prepared in many, many different ways. There you see some of the foods of anguilla and uh, conch fritters. We have fried fish. We have that beautiful callaloo uh, sauce, et cetera. This is Antigua. Uh, Antigua was settled primarily by the British and still has a very British feel to it. One of the, it's famous for having different beach for every day of the year, but it lacks the lushness of such islands as Dominica or Jamaica. You have these beautiful coral seas, these wonderful little villages there pink and white sandy beaches, crystal clear waters. And uh, they love their cricket that obviously has that British influence there. If you look at some of these images, it has that colonial British look to it or some of the earliest here. The resorts are pretty isolated and conservative, but very glamorous and certainly reflecting that British feel that you have. If you look at these colorful little uh, villages, beautiful uh, resorts there that just sort of hang off the cliff there crystal blue waters, and there are a lot of historic naval sites here as well. Also excellent for uh, shopping. This is Aruba. We're switching nationalities once again. This is, uh, was originally settled by the Dutch, uh, sort of discovered in the 1970s with its desert-like terrain and lunar interior surfaces. You have these smart little villages and little marinas there, very famous for its oil uh, factories. Those have diminished and salt factories. If you're on an island with salt water, chances are you're going to um, do this. Not of this has uh, left today. Today, the uh, vacationers come for the reliable sunshine, one of the sunniest islands in the Caribbean. Rains a lot less than most islands there. Spectacular beaches and pretty settled when it comes to uh, racial equity also. You have flamingos on the beach. You've got beautiful, uh, white sand beaches there. You have these wonderful little uh, malls and shops that have now sprung up catering to um, uh, gamblers and uh, high rise resorts that we're seeing there. Uh, situated just 15 miles north of the Venezuelan coast, this is a flat and riverless island, uh, considered one of the most peaceful and beautiful destinations in the Caribbean. The Bahamas used to get all of the attention. I think it still does here. It was originally founded as a plantation economy that made its aristocracy rich off the back of black uh, African slave laborers. It was a staunchly loyal member of the British Commonwealth for generations. It's uh, the most easternmost island with beautiful coral beaches. Again, if you look at the slide, you think it's a little out of place. This looks like something in Eastern Europe or out on the English countryside, except for the palm trees. So bright, colorful. Uh, island that certainly uh, is worth visiting for uh, the British influence. This is one of the newer resorts there. This is the Atlantis Resort. I remember when this first opened and they did some TV spots from there. It looks just absolutely beautiful. Someone told me it's quite expensive. I haven't checked prices, but it's one of those all-inclusive over-the-top properties um, that is very, very popular in the Bahamas. Getting our perspective here, we look at the West Grand Bahama, Freeport City. We see all these other islands there. Some of them are very tiny. Some of them have no facilities whatsoever, but the uh, topography uh, really is varied. We're seeing a lot of ecotourism switching away from some of the uh, other uh, more interesting resorts. This is St. Lucia. Uh, this is a very, very beautiful um, island. I think this is one of the most interesting in uh, the Caribbean here. Uh, south of Martinique, second largest island in the Windward Islands. And you have all this wonderful volcano, something right out of Gilligan's Island or Treasure Island. Uh, in 1803, the British won control of the island. Uh, you still see Creole and French spoken here as well. Black sand beaches, white beaches, uh, bubbling sulfur springs, beautiful mountain scenery here in the area. All these wonderful coves, I can see why uh, the posh resorts and uh, more uh, expensive properties pop up in this particular land. 
that's that beautiful volcano up there, uh, extinct volcano, but sitting at the base of the uh, volcanic mountains there, you have these beautiful resorts, absolutely spectacular waking up to that, I would imagine. Haiti has had all kinds of problems, of course. Uh, it shares the island with um, uh, the uh, uh, Dominica, and they've had lots and lots of challenges there, uh, certainly one of the poorest economies in the Western hemisphere. This poor little country has been ravaged by earthquakes and then um, hurricanes. We see relief efforts here. It's a very, very poor country, lots and lots of uh, infrastructure problems in there. And uh, we've seen revolutions periodically pop up in this uh, area as well. Bermuda, absolutely spectacular. You have uh, these wonderful, beautiful pink resorts there that everybody just absolutely just loves and flocks to them as well. Yes, home of the beautiful Bermuda shorts, um, but also these wonderful little villages. Uh, a lot of people say that they love the city of Hamilton. It's very, very English in its nature. Uh, lots of movies have been filmed here. They have wonderful beaches, wonderful uh, facilities. This is certainly, if you're looking for maybe your first introduction, this might be a good one. Famous for its pink beaches, spectacular sunsets. You can see these beautiful resorts. So if you're looking for luxury, or if you're looking for simplicity, you'll find it here. Find uh, some wonderful old colonial and some very, very interesting architecture throughout this area. It's been very commercially developed. So if you're looking for something more laid back, quiet, uh, maybe one of the other islands might be better for you. Um, Barbados, this is a, a British uh, Commonwealth for a very, very long time as well. Um, the uh, uh, attitude is very, very English in style. You'll find uh, English spoken widely uh, by just about every facet of society there. Um, it was, uh, it has these beautiful, beautiful bay sand beaches there. Uh, sailing around this is not particularly large, but you have a lot of tourist development also. And as we look at the food here in a minute, we're gonna see a lot of the similarities between these. This is uh, an island that I didn't know much about. I'd love to hear if anybody's been to this particular island. It's uh, the strongest historical and cultural links are to Holland. And although long considered a poor relation to nearby Curacao, uh, Bonaire has better scuba diving and better bird uh, viewing than any of its neighbors. It's dry and inhospitable, but uh, thrives with miles of offshore reefs. So excellent uh, climate for uh, scuba diving and things like that. Famous for its flamingos and iguanas. These iguanas get to be uh, two feet uh, and they've sort of been domesticated. You can find them just about anywhere in strange places. Uh, famous for its lobster and conch uh, fritters. We're going to see that. Again, if you look at the beautiful, wonderful, bright colors there, this is really that Dutch influence that we have. The British Virgin Islands, still a British um, crown colony, a uh, lustily forested chain consists of 50 small mountainous islands, um, depending on how many rocks and caves and inlets you look at, but uh, superb for sailors. The British Virgin Islands are less populated and less developed. Um, tort uh, Tortola, the main island, they have all kinds of wonderful laid back lifestyle, beautiful sandy beaches and small little British influenced inns there. It's a picture of some of those little, uh, we might call them B&Bs, but these are just sort of little inns uh, influenced highly by the British occupation of the land and the settlement of it. Beautiful village there as well. I can't imagine going to any of these Caribbean islands without getting out into the water and looking at it from a different perspective and lots and lots of incredible scenery. So everything from volcanic areas to um, the incredible cuisine that you're gonna find there. Looks like lots and lots of lobster that's out there. So again, uh, this would be a great treat for anybody who enjoys good seafood. The Cayman Islands this is a trio of islands. This is a real uh, area for international finance and offshore banking. These uh, set near the southern coast of the Cuba, prosperous nation dependent on Britain for its economic survival and attracting million air expatriates from all of the world. Very, very, very lenient tax and banking laws. They're known as offshore banking center. Um, the uh, absence of direct taxes 
uh, of the 50 largest banks, all of them have some type of present in, presence in the Cayman Islands. So uh, a lot of this money goes to the government, which is why they can continue to expand. A uh, real shortage of workers, though, unless you're a professional in the banking industry. You can see the wealth in this particular um, island. They have the highest per capita income of anywhere in the Caribbean, due probably to those very uh, lenient banking laws, and let's just say a little bit of laundering of money probably. English is the official language, uh, certainly of commerce as well. Uh, the Caymans were settled by uh, 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 Columbus in uh, 1503 on his second and third voyage. Curacao is probably the one that I would start with only because from a distance, it looks like this, uh, these images would take you right to Amsterdam here. Uh, it was settled by the Arawak people from the South American mainland. It was first visited by the Europeans in 1499, settled by the Spanish and then later the Dutch who established as a major center for the Dutch West India Company, certainly spices and exotic foodstuffs there. Uh, the Spanish deported the entire indigenous people as slaves in the 1500s, and it's the home of the oldest continuously inhabited Jewish community in the Western Hemisphere, originally formed by Sepharic Jews who emigrated from Portugal in the 1500s. Um, grows only cactus, but uh, they have figured it out. The Dutch, of course, with their clever canals and reclaiming that land, did something similar here on the island of Curaçao, one of the busiest trading posts for the Dutch here. A uh, beautiful, beautiful, curious mixture of bloodlines, including African, Dutch, Venezuelan, and even Pakistani here. Known for its beautiful beaches and uh, its capital with this pastel colored colonial architecture, uh, sand and surf, and these beautiful pastel villages. Um, you're gonna hear Dutch spoken here as well as English and local dialects. Dominica is a very interesting uh, uh, island here as well, not to be confused with uh, the Dominican Republic here. Uh, it's the largest and most mountainous island of the Windward Islands. Mysterious uh, uh, little visited island of waterfalls and rushing streams, rainforest. Uh, many of them have this beautiful black um, beaches there. Uh, still a fair amount of volcanic activity here. When Columbus ushered in the era of colonization in 1493, uh, wiped out most of the native uh, Arawaks, the indigenous people, and he renamed the island Dominica uh, because he made landfall on Sunday, Domingo. This is the Dominican Republic. It occupies two thirds of Hispaniola, the island that it shares with Haiti, but the two countries could not be more different. Haiti, of course, ravaged with all kinds of natural disasters and poverty. Dominicans have experienced political and uh, civil disorder, ethnic tensions, uh, booms and bust of the area, long periods of military rule, uh, an oppressive dictatorship, and then military intervention by the United States uh, twice in the 1916s and 1965. So the troubles have paled in comparison to that of Haiti. Why is this island so important and why does it periodically pop up? Really, it has to do with its strategic location uh, leading to the Caribbean and the Panama Canal. You can see there that two countries sort of occupy the same um, island. Very, very different, different in style, different in food, different in uh, cultural backgrounds and certainly uh, socio-political differences as well. So uh, this will be not be the last that we hear about these two countries. I always worry when hurricane season begins that uh, poor Haiti should not have to go through another earthquake or um, a, a hurricane there also. Interesting islands, it says uh, on the Dominican Republic. Again, you can see a little bit more affluent lifestyle, beautiful little villages there. Grenada, this is the southernmost nation of the Windward Islands. It's one of the lushest islands of the Caribbean. Uh, gentle climate, extravagantly fertile ver um, volcanic soil. This has been primarily uh, ruled by the UK. Uh, if you remember many years ago, we had a little conflict there with the Grenada uh, Island and the intervention. Financial support from the UK has been very important to bolster the economy. 
Uh, many of these were old uh, fortresses. They were defensive spots for whatever country. So you still see some remnants of this uh, as you get higher up into the mountains, like just about everywhere, your homes are gonna become more extravagant, more expensive. A lot of local color here, beautiful white beaches. It's uh, now independent. Uh, St. George, the capital, is really one of the most charming cities in the area. Moving on to Jamaica, boy, we certainly have our caricatures and our lush, wonderful foods. This is some of the most interesting uh, music, culture. Uh, Jamaica really rebranded itself as a honeymooners destination. It's had some challenges with some outbreaks of violence and things like that. You have a lot of uh, ethnic groups, a lot of religious groups, a lot of gang activity as well. So you really sort of need to keep abreast if you're going to Jamaica at any given time there uh, up or down. But the food is certainly spectacular in Jamaica, probably one of the most well-known of the cuisines and that's a good thing. You have a uh, beautiful uh, Jamaican rum that has become uh, world famous. You have these spectacular dishes that have just taken on all the influence of all the countries that have settled in the particular area. Martinique is one of the most exotic French uh, speaking destinations in the Caribbean. Uh, it was a site of a sediment demolished by an active volcano. You can see there in the middle picture, uh, St. Pierre was pretty much destroyed by this as well. Uh, this is known as the Island of Flowers and visited by Columbus originally in 1502, full of flavor and great flair, lots of tropical uh, charm to Martinique. So whether it's St. Bart's or St. Bartolome, uh, either way here, uh, this is part of the French uh, tradition. And uh, it's a small hilly island population of just about 7,000 and this beautiful verdant terrain, pleasant white sand beaches, occupied by the French in 1648, was sold to Sweden in 1784, but a return to France in 1877. <clears throat> so this island has all kinds of European influence. You can see the uh, effects of that in the architecture, the design of this, but you can see how very, very lush this particular area. This is the place if you wanna wind down and just get away from all and get away from the stress of the tourism, this is the island for you. Uh, turtles, beautiful white sand beaches, uh, lovely little more intimate uh, resorts and inns, a uh, great place to just relax if you wanna snorkel or be on the beach. We're gonna see some of the really beautiful aspects of this. And I think I know we won't be able to cover all of them, but this is St. John, uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands. This is an area that is obviously very, very popular with uh, tourists as well. Uh, it was originally Danish and given over to the U.S. in 1917. Um, it was a, a plantation economy here, so lots of slave stories and some of the cruelty of the sugar industry as well. Uh, sometimes mountainous here, sometimes uh, beautiful sandy beaches here. St. Kitts, another one of those uh, lovely uh, islands as well. You can see the beautiful beaches, the marinas there. The first English settlement, uh, very rich in British maritime history, uh, was one of the richest sugarcane plantations. Nowadays, it is uh, known for its natural scenery. Uh, there are some restored plantations that you can visit also. Uh, you see Nevis and St. Kitts there. This is an island that has become uh, really well known for those that love the Caribbean, chance to get off the beaten track a little bit. Montserrat, if you remember, uh, this was uh, pretty much destroyed by that volcano. It just erupted with a powerful force there, leaving all this beautiful black volcanic rock and ash in uh, the beaches as well. Um, not really a lot to see there unless you're looking for ecotourism or if you're interested in this. You can see down at the bottom left, there's a, a, a aerial picture when the mountain exploded. It's, uh, it provides for great lush fertile soil, but it's gonna be a while before or if it's ever developed again. And then we have St. Martin uh, or St. Martin, depending on your, your pronunciation of it. This is a scrub covered island uh, owned by the Dutch. You can see it just is a beautiful little lush community there with great beaches. Uh, contained, the Dutch side has the major airport, uh, more shops there. The French side has some of the most beautiful posh hotels. 
Uh, you're going to find Dutch food, obviously, on the Dutch side and very, very French inspired French food. You can see, again, it's another one of those islands that if you walk uh, across it or travel across it, you're going to hear it first because of the difference between Dutch and French. So uh, this would be a wonderful one if you want that European experience without having to go there. And lastly, the Turks and Caicos. This is um, actually part of the Bahamian archipelago. Uh, southernmost islands here, uh, directly north of the Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Um, Grand Turk is ringed, uh, ringed by abundant marine life, but most of it is flat and rocky and fairly dry. If you love uh, diving, this is definitely the place for you. <clears throat> Those of you that have been, a couple of you had uh, uh, mentioned in chat that uh, you've been to the US Virgin Islands there. Uh, the dollar is still supreme here. English is spoken wildly. This would probably be a good introduction for those that have been there. So whether it's beach or whether it's the ocean or sailing or snorkeling or scuba diving, yes, that's an important part of it, but the food is really what uh, makes us, uh, each of these islands so wonderful. So let's take a look at some of those. There's a classic sort of peasant Caribbean dish there. Uh, it's Caribbean cuisine is this exciting melting pot of global flavors influenced by multicultural history of this diverse region. We have uh, people from all over the world came and settled, bringing their culinary uh, traditions with them. What are some of the key elements in Caribbean cuisine? Well, certainly it's very, very colorful. You have braising, you have stewing, you have roasting, you have that barbecue flavor as well. What are the, some of the essential ingredients here? Um, well, obviously rice is an important part of it. That's certainly that Asian influence. Uh, we have a lot of beans there. Beans are an excellent source of protein. We have a lot of African ingredients. And now we see things like chutney uh, from India. We see some interesting ingredients, some native ingredients as well. Certainly the wonderful variety of different types of fish that we, we have, uh, finned fish as well as seafood. You have breadfruit, you have those beautiful plantains there. Uh, those are those green ones. And then you have all the wonderful spices in different styles. Certainly coconut, tamarind, salted cod that we looked at. Those are those beautiful scotch bonnet peppers. We know them as habanero. So you have this mixture of sweet and sour, tangy, hot and spicy with cooling ingredients here. And one of the key elements is sofrito. Now we've talked about French cuisine in the back and French cuisine is really based upon that, uh, what we call mirepoix, a mix of onion, celery and carrots. Uh, here in sofrito, which certainly comes out of Spain and the uh, Central American as well. Sofrito means to fry and lightly, we're lightly sauteing these uh, flavorful uh, spices, ingredients. Frequently we have the addition of some heat to this. So sofrito and mirepoix are really the foundations of these different type of cuisines. You'll find a much more of the sofrito certainly around the islands. There's a couple of examples of them. I'm gonna send you a couple of different recipes for sofrito. And this is one of those wonderful staples. So you wanna cook this down, you wanna roast those aromatics, get a real foundation for many of these Caribbean dishes. Rice and beans, very popular. That was a dish I made last Saturday for the family uh, in anticipation of our time together. Got just wonderful rice there. You can use kidney beans. Uh, I like black beans just because of the color and the texture of them. Nice mix of the sofrito vegetables and then some jerk chicken with the uh, price of a lot of our proteins. This is a great way to use a bone-in thighs or chicken legs. Normally I shy away from those particular cuts, but in the case of Jamaican jerk, that's really uh, important. I will talk a little bit about Jamaican um, uh, jerk seasoning here. Um, that's Kalaloo. This is this wonderful mixture. Lots and lots of different variations on this. Lots of different styles to prepare this in. So if you like kale, if you like collard greens or mustard greens, this is a great way to uh, cook them down. They're almost to the point of stewed. Sometimes they're pureed and used as a sauce. Plantains, we discuss when they're green, they behave like a potato. Uh, don't try to expect something sweet out of this. They're very tangy. They've got that little tannic acid in them, but when they turn jet black, that's when they really become quite delicious. So these can be fried or baked. I'll send you a couple of different recipes on those. There's your Caribbean plate there. Um, some really, really wonderful dishes, bright, colorful 
imagery that just sort of reflects it. Here's a classic Caribbean uh, table there. You've got fish uh, combined with plantains. You have really highly seasoned stews. You have wonderful fruits and vegetables from the islands or those things that have been brought in. So mixing them all together is something really special. This is that beautiful bread. Uh, this is very much influenced by those bolillos that we see in uh, Mexican cuisine. This is a kind of nice chewy bread here, the best of Italian bread with um, the softness of uh, those Italian rolls or Spanish rolls that we love. Mofongo, this is a uh, dish that's prepared all over the Caribbean here. This is a uh, wonderful dish of mashed uh, plantains frequently with this as well. Uh, it's prepared all over the Caribbean. One of those great dishes. If you've never had plantains, uh, this is a good introduction for it. Lots of variations on this. This is a beautiful fish dish here that uh, is very popular everywhere from the uh, Puerto Rico to uh, the islands. You're going to find this classic Jamaican dish here, and it's seasoned and marinated. It's a, a frying fish with this peppery vinegar based bell peppers, carrots, and onions. And then you have this kind of sweet and sour aspect. So if you can get a nice uh, saltwater fish, this is a great way to prepare it. Very popular. Uh, carne guisada, this is wonderful. This is stewed meat that's uh, slightly drier than what you might find in an American uh, pot roast or stew. You see a lot of sweet potatoes involved in these dishes as well. So you have that sweet and tangy, the wonderful marinade of this. A uh, great way to use more uh, inexpensive cuts of beef. And uh, you could certainly do it with pork if you wanted to. Uh, this is uh, obviously a Creole African influenced here. This is a wonderful uh, deep fried chicken. This is one you wanna use the bone in pieces of this. This has just a, uh, a great buttermilk flavor on it, clearly influenced by some of the African dishes there. Uh, this is a plate of moros e cristanos, basically Moors and Christians. So you have this representation of the white rice um, flavored with the beans, perhaps. And then you have the dark beans that represent the darker skin Moors that came up from North Africa, certainly into Spain. This was transferred over into the Caribbean islands. This is Jamaican jerk. What is Jamaican jerk? Well, Jamaican jerk is sort of like curry and it has... Um, used to refer to a pig that was slowly grilled over a fire of pimento wood. Uh, today, it's mostly chicken or pork uh, with this. Uh, some vegetables are done with this. Um, you certainly can make your own Jamaican jerk seasoning, but the idea is that you have this deep fire, this um, deep well fire, and the food is lowered and raised in it. That's sort of the jerk idea. Um, I would recommend you buy a commercial Jamaican jerk seasoning mix just for consistency more than anything, but it is going to attain, contain some really wonderful uh, flavors. It's going to have allspice and chilies and nutmeg and cinnamon, so it's spicy and it's hot and sweet all at the same time. Um, if you've never had Jamaican jerk uh, chicken, this is one of those wonderful dishes, uh, certainly does well in a crock pot. Rice and um, eggs here, of course, we think of this as uh, sort of lunch and dinner, but putting them together, why not start with some rice as many countries do? This is definitely that Asian influence here as well. So rather than French toast and pancakes or muffins, just try it with some rice, uh, complex carbohydrates, maybe with some plantains on the side. Conch fritters are absolutely just wonderful. Uh, outside of the Caribbean, it's hard to find conch but it is spectacularly wonderful. Uh, treated uh, differently than shrimp or scallops, this can be tough like abalone, but when it's minced and done into a fritter, it can be absolutely wonderful. This is uh, literally middle of the night here. This is a Cuban dish here. This is a really wonderful sandwich. When we talk about uh, Cuba, uh, Puerto Rico, we'll come back to this, but basically it's a ham and cheese, but oh, it's really good with a little bit of pickles in there. Uh, we'll come back and talk about that. Uh, the, the little beef that you do see in some of the islands is treated with a lot of respect, usually slow cooked as well. Cuban dish there that we see. Uh, the mojito, uh, although it uh, had its origins probably in Cuba, 
uh, or in Puerto Rico. This is a magnificent dish when it's hot and sticky out. This is uh, fresh mint leaves and lime, uh, traditionally with some white rum in this. This is a wonderful drink, turning it into some ice cream as well. Uh, this packs a little bit of punch in a really refreshing drink. A Cuba Libra, uh, rum and Coke with a little bit of mint and lime in this. This is a classic starting drink for a lot of young people, but it still is one of the world's great drinks. Hemingway special here. If you like Manhattans, this is an island version of it. Hemingway spent a lot of time in the Caribbean, really made that area quite famous. Then we have the beautiful daiquiri as well. If you've ever had a daiquiri that's too sweet or too cloying, they're probably not making it from scratch. They're probably using a daiquiri. This is not a complicated cocktail. I'll send you a couple of variations on this. Uh, these became wildly popular in the 70s and 80s, strawberry, coconut, all different flavors. And then you have this wonderful drink. And if you've never had Jamaica, Jamaica is the word for hibiscus. And they sell these in ethnic stores. Don't pick your neighbor's um, hibiscus. They've probably been treated with some type of pesticide. But these are the beautiful flowers of the hibiscus plant. And you just reconstitute it. If you want to wrap some rum around this or um, vodka, go ahead. This is a wonderful, really cleansing, refreshing, nice tangy. If you like cranberry, cran raspberry, uh, just get some uh, Jamaica, some hibiscus, and uh, just steep it over some water like you might do sun tea, a wonderful drink. Another very important drink here is Jamaica Blue Mountain Coffee. Oh, yummy. This is one of the world's most expensive and rarest coffees. Grows in the Blue Mountain. Uh, there's just something about the particular climate that makes it so delicious. Very, very steep altitude there. Uh, I priced this out recently. It was getting close to $25 a pound. So if you're drinking less but better, as a lot of people are, um, this is a beautiful, beautiful coffee. Very low in acid, but tons of flavor. The aroma on this is spectacular. If I'm making tiramisu, that wonderful coffee liqueur laced Italian dessert, I'm going to spend a little bit of money and buy some Jamaica Blue Mountain coffee. Uh, exceptionally good. This is fish tea, a strange name for this as well, but uh, this is a light soup or fish broth uh, seasoned with salt and pepper and thyme, usually uh, very thick and uh, hearty. You know, you might use inexpensive cuts of meat, again, utilizing all the bounty of the sea, adding bell peppers, carrots, maybe even some green bananas on this. Considered an aphrodisiac in Jamaica, so you'll see this in a lot of brunch menus where people are on their honeymoon. This is fried yucca. Yucca has a wonderful flavor. Um, I know you have a large Hispanic community like we do here. This is one of those great dishes. If you like tater tots, if you like mashed potatoes or what we call smashed potatoes, try these fried yucca. There are some frozen versions out there. Yucca can be a little challenging to work with, but um, it's the best of a sweet potato with a regular potato and usually made into these fritters and then deep fried. Rice and corn, what a great way to combine these. You can add all kinds of flavors. I use a lot of dried lime when I'm making this dish. Very, very simple. This is uh, clearly that Central American influence and the Spanish influence as well. Great side dish. You can add a little bit of chopped parsley, add your favorite seasoning, maybe some cilantro to this also as a side dish. This is Festival. This is a wonderful mixture of vegetables, that we have, uh, you see the sweet potatoes there also. You have wonderful flavors going on in this. And it really is just a nice side dish, uh, maybe a little bit slightly influenced by uh, succotash. Brown stewed chicken here. This is a, sort of a variation on uh, Coco Van using some red wine. In this case, there's a whole lot of rum in here, a lot of adobo sauce in here, very spicy but a, a nice stew dish. This is great for this time of year in the crock pot. Stamp and go. This is a very, very interesting dish here as well. This has wonderful flavors in it. It's uh, really sort of a biscuit, sort of a Johnny cake almost. This is um, clearly uh, English influenced here with one of those wonderful fun sort of names. Uh, cracked conch, boy, if you can get it, you're awfully lucky here with rice and peas. Uh, like abalone, it's expensive. If you can get it, chances are you're probably going to find it in an Asian market. If you're lucky enough to have a Caribbean market, uh, it's probably going to be sold frozen to us. 
Aki and saltfish. We talked a little bit about both of these here um, earlier, but Aki is this very, very interesting sort of ingredient there. It's hard to describe the flavor of this. It's a little bit like, um, uh, it's unusual fruit actually. It's very popular for, uh, as a nourishing breakfast in Jamaica. Uh, it's a tricky ingredient, Aki, because there is a toxicity to it. Not safe to consume until this yellow meat and black seeds are uh, visible in the fruit. So it was introduced to the islands. Looks like a smooth reddish peach, but very popular in Jamaica. <clears throat> Have a lot of marinated vegetables here as well. This is an interesting dish that I ran across. I'd never seen this before, but it's this Haitian relish, a combination of pickled vegetables, shredded cabbage, carrots, onions, spicy peppers. Uh, it's a little bit like that kimchi influence there. Um, uh, spiciness of it pairs well with almost any main dish. So I'll send you a wonderful recipe for that also. This is a very interesting dish here. This is a traditional Haitian dish made with goat uh, meat, which is becoming more and more popular as a main ingredient. Orange juice, lime juice, it develops this crispy brownish exterior, usually served with fried plantains, as you see there, and uh, very popular um, in the island of Haiti. Again, poor man's cuisine. Conch, we've talked a little bit about that. If you're ever lucky enough to get these, probably have to go to a Caribbean restaurant, but that's okay. Wonderful combination of plantains, uh, marinated beef in this. Uh, we'll come back to that one. Uh, goat water, it sounds very strange, but basically, again, you have this wonderful marinade. This is a slow cooked one. Traditionally, yes, made with goats, but you don't necessarily have to use that. You could use chicken with it. And how about some of the wonderful sweets that we have from the island? We have the uh, French influence, Dutch influence, Spanish influence, and the Caribbean island. So wonderful Bahamian bread pudding there. I'll send you the recipe for that. Uh, this is a mix of flan and creme caramel, heavily influenced by the French and Dutch influence, as well as the Spanish there. We have these wonderful pastries. Each of the islands specializes in something unique. And here's one of the most wonderful ones of this. Uh, this is a Cuban specialty here. It's a sweet treat of sugar and coconut and honey and pineapple and nuts wrapped in a palm leaf here. The name comes from uh, cornet, meaning uh, a cone, if you will. Uh, you can find this in some specialty markets. I see this in Caribbean markets. Occasionally see a version of this in Spanish markets also. Hummingbird cake is an absolutely wonderful dessert. This was completely made up as a uh, marketing campaign for Jamaica. And it's this wonderful tropical cake here, pineapple, uh, pecans, bananas, all topped with this cream cheese frosting. Think of this as a Caribbean carrot cake, but so much better. Sweet potato pudding. Uh, I know that in the South, you love your sweet potatoes as I do. Um, I use them when I want color, when I want some natural sweetness to it. So adding some raisins to this, uh, to, the sweet potato brings that nice sweetness to it. A little bit of toasted coconut. This is a wonderful variation on uh, a potato or bread pudding. This is a very unusual item. This is essentially sort of a trifle. This is called red grout. Don't be afraid of the name of it here. Uh, it's a signature dish from the U.S. Virgin Islands. It's uh, this really decadent tapioca with guava on it. You can find guava at some specialty markets, but uh, it's wonderful to have around. Uh, very, very uh, indulgent dish here. Uh, at Mark to commemorate the uh, transfer from Denmark uh, to the United States. Rum cake, Christmas cake, uh, rum pudding, whatever you wanna call it. I'm gonna send you a couple of wonderful variations on this, not just at Christmas time. This is a great indulgent cake with a whole lot of rum and a whole lot of molasses in it. There's that beautiful bread pudding. I never met a bread pudding that I didn't like. This one with the tropical fruits and the rum is particularly good. Uh, don't be uh, intimidated by this greater cake. It's a traditional dessert with fresh grated coconut. You can find this sometimes packaged as candy with it as well. So you've got the sticky coconut here, red food coloring to make it look a little bit more appealing. This 
magnificent bulla cake here. It's a Jamaican cake with molasses and ginger and nutmeg, some of my favorite spices that they use in the island. They're usually small loaves, very inexpensive, um, using baking soda as the leavening in this. Uh, uh, duck and do, uh, duck anew. This is a boiled Caribbean pudding. Uh, it has cornmeal, similar to uh, sweet polenta, grated coconut and brown sugar. There's cinnamon and vanilla and nutmeg and raisins in this. This is easily within the realm of anybody. If it looks a little bit like a sweet tamale, it's sort of that sort of the inspiration here. A little bit of dollop of whipped cream is really nice on that. Rum cake, yes, we've talked about this uh, a couple times here. Uh, there's some great recipes. I recommend baking it in a bunt pan just to elevate it a little bit. This is a sweet, moist, and gummy dessert made from cassava root and sweet potatoes. Again, more nutmeg and butter and milk in here. Um, uh, don't know much about the origins of this, but cassava was introduced into the, bar, uh, the uh, islands from the Arawak, the natives. Uh, if you can find cassava, I, I have seen it frozen uh, or the puree with this, but it's uh, very sponge-like, uh, gelatinous, really the best of pudding and the best of cake. Gazada is this wonderful, wonderful dessert. This is heavily influenced by Dutch culture. This uh, pastry shell of sweet and spicy coconut filling. It's got this um, wonderful uh, Portuguese and Jewish and Dutch influence there. Looks a little like a mincemeat pie, but so much better. And this is a sweet dessert from the Bahamas. This is a stuffed a jelly roll stuffed with a wonderful tropical fruits. If you can't find guava or passion fruit, you can use raspberry or strawberry. It's a sweet buttery sauce containing rum or brandy, of course. And then you have uh, some of the candies there. You have these tamarind. If you've never had tamarind before, uh, usually you can find these at the checkout counter at um, ethnic markets here, but it's sticky and fleshy and brown sugary. You've got this spicy version as well as the sweet version of that. These are wonderful little meringues here served with this um, powdered sugar, um, also uh, translates to sort of meringue kisses, but they're consumed immediately. You can add coffee or vanilla to these. Wonderful little Dominican dessert. These jawbreakers here, boy, they are sweet, extra hard, crunchy, uh, very popular in uh, Trinidad and Tobago. There are uh, lots of sesame seed influence there. The uh, word bane, uh, bene is the African word for sesame seed. So if you like sesame, these are great. They're very much like those little Japanese um, uh, hard treats as well, which again shows that conglomeration of uh, different cuisines. This last one, this is a Trini dessert it's prepared uh, for the Muslim holiday of Eid. And it's made with vermicelli noodles and almond and milk and sugar and raisins. They're first, um, the noodles are first parched into a golden brown and then cooked to this uh, thick consistency. So it has this wonderful sort of uh, spicy aromatic dessert that we absolutely just love. Uh, looks a lot like uh, other Eastern European, there's really the influence of all these different traditions. So we've gone from sort of nuts to dessert here as well in the Caribbean, but I hope this has inspired you. Uh, many of these ingredients can be readily available. The most challenging one you may have to find is the Jamaican jerk seasoning. And I actually bought a, a one pound container on Amazon because I had a hard time finding it surprisingly. But if you have a Caribbean market in your neighborhood, go in and take a look at some of these. I will send you some of these recipes. If you run into any challenges in finding these ingredients, I'm gonna send you my email again and my phone number. And if you run into any problem finding them, let me know, I'll be happy to search for you. When in doubt, uh, Amazon probably has a lot of these also. So uh, a couple of you have reported uh, that you've been to some of the Caribbean islands here. I hope you enjoyed the cuisine of it. Um, if you haven't, feel free to unmute yourself and I'd love to hear some of your recollections of the uh, Caribbean flavors, uh, any good or bad memories of your Caribbean vacation. <clears throat> Sue, did you have a question? 
No, I didn't. Haven't been. So I haven't been. Yeah, it's it's on my list here as well. Just don't go during hurricane season. It's kind of like right. Arizona. Don't come. You know, everyone's so attracted by these deals in September and October, but that's prime hurricane season for them as well. So let's pray that they don't suffer any of them because the cuisine, the people, all these wonderful different islands there, uh, it's, a, it's sort of a really great way. I would just love to maybe take a boat for a week and just hit many of the different islands. So, well, if there's no questions, I thank you all very much. This was delightful getting together with you again. Um, I'm sure we will see each other very, very soon. I don't know what we'll be tackling. Uh, we're going to be in the dog days of August here coming up soon, but I love our monthly get togethers. I will send those recipes out to you later today. And if you have any challenges with them, by all means, text me, email me, call, and I will be happy to uh, help you through some of these uh, really, really interesting and exotic ingredients. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marion or uh, anybody have any last housekeeping that you need to do? I had a question. How do you pronounce your last name? Canepa. Canepa. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, you. I've, got a, I've got a class on finger foods coming up next week. So all foods that we eat with our fingers and um, the Italian version of canepa comes from the same type of uh, version as the French version, canapé. So small little tasty things. So there you are. <laughs> so thank you all for joining us. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for support, supporting the program. It's wonderful. Stay cool. Stay out of the heat. Make yourself a um, little daiquiri. So I toast you all. Have a wonderful week. Bye-bye. Thank you.